wow, it's like a live stream, except you're here. <laughs> it's scarier this way. Um, yeah, so my name's Natalie Wynn. I am a YouTuber. Um, I guess we don't really like that word because it's associated with people who film dead bodies. But, um, you know, sometimes you have to face the facts and I make my money on the internet as a YouTuber, so that's what I am. Um, I'm the creator of a channel called ContraPoints. And today I will tell you a little bit about that channel and about the circumstances that led me to make it and what it's done to me. So, that's my channel. And you can see I cover a variety of, you know, safe, non-controversial topics. <laughs> Uh, Nazis, communism, uh, sexual deviation, cults, that sort of thing. And I have such a difficult time describing what this channel is. Like, if I'm in the back of an Uber and the driver asks me, like, what do you do? I'm like, I make YouTube videos. And they're like, what's your channel about? And I say, makeup. <laughs> Contour. <laughs> Contour points. <laughs> because I don't... <laughs> But um, if I were to attempt to describe it, I would say that it's maybe a, it's about internet culture, right? The bad parts. And it's about just being alive in 2018. It's about, um, it's kind of a long theatrical response to fascism. So let's look at a sample. Hail, mortals! I come to thee from my fairy grove to bring thee tidings of great woe. Western culture is being destroyed by cocks and by gender bending, intoxication, and sodomy. You know, things that have never happened in Europe. So that's me as a fairy queen talking about. Um, Nazis. Um, so how did that happen? How did we end up in this situation where that was a necessary thing? Well, it all starts with Cox. Um, so the year was 2016, and Barack Obama was president of the United States. We were about to elect our first woman president, and things were kind of going okay. Um, but the internet was not okay. Um, I, I guess at this moment, had just dropped out of a philosophy PhD program because the examined life is actually not worth living. <laughs> and I don't know, I was like an Uber driver, a piano teacher, a paralegal, and just looking for what to do next. And Back in like 2009, I had been kind of like an atheist YouTuber, or at least I had kind of like followed that world. Um, so in my subscriptions box, in my recommended videos box in 2016, it was suddenly a lot of like, why feminism is ruining the planet? And it's like Black Lives Matter is trash. And I was like, hmm, interesting. So... <laughs> I thought that I could use my, my skills, my, my education to kind of like maybe do a channel that would counter um, some of these videos and respond to them. So that was the original idea for the, the Contra Points channel. Those were the points it was against. So that's what I did for the first year of the channel. Um, I made kind of what it seems in retrospect, like really reckless videos being like, hello, Nazi 4chan, let's talk about how wrong you are. <laughs> um, which, you know, you don't just do that. But um, at the time I was, well, I should explain. So I used to be a um, little bit of a man. <laughs> Uh, you know, I'm not proud of it, but these things happen. <laughs> we all make mistakes. <laughs> and I guess I I realized in, in, you know, last year that I need to transition. Um, it wasn't an option. It was just what I had to do to live, be alive. And... 
that was unfortunate for my YouTube career <laughs> because I had watched for a long time the way trans women, all women really, are treated on YouTube. And so when I realized that me as this person with this anti 4chan Nazi YouTube channel was going to now have to become a trans woman, I was like, oh shit. <laughs> I'm very thoroughly fucked. <laughs> um, so my old channel, like my old persona, like here I am. Um, this is me before I transitioned in the persona that I had as some kind of cross-stressing um, leather mommy Nazi Frankenfurter kind of thing. Um, and like I was actually going to show you a clip of this, but I can't stand to watch my old videos for even like 10 seconds. Like, it's like agony to listen to my voice and to listen, like, so that's another thing is that I can't escape this. Like, that's something that I haven't even really begun to think about for what it's like to be trans on the internet is that once you're on the internet, like that's there forever. You're always stuck with this. Oh, it's not up there, but with the, yeah, with that, yeah. Um, so, that's not the only bad thing though, like more generally speaking, um, it's not a good idea to be a woman. <laughs> and I had been shielded in a lot of ways by this like degenerate cross-dresser persona because it was, it was grotesque, I knew it was grotesque, I didn't really identify with it. And so people would, yeah sure, I'd get harassed and people would come after me, but like what are they gonna do? They would call me a degenerate and a cock. Like none of that scratched even the surface of my emotional well-being. But when I started transitioning, like if you wanna ruin a trans woman's day, that's real easy. <laughs> and it made things harder, people were harder on me about, a month after I came out, I was just fu fully doxxed, like address, every old picture of me um, before I transitioned, my full name, my full dead name, everything, because that's what they do. Um, so things got harder and it was difficult um, suddenly to have to kind of like be very publicly transitioning. It's an awkward thing to do to try to do a gender transition with a camera on you because it's a second adolescence, it is. And you don't want to do even your first adolescence, you don't want to do any adolescence on camera, it's, it's very unpleasant. Um, but I knew that was going to happen. And I'm one of the few people maybe who's doing this online that at least I can say I knew what I was getting into because I had read about Gamergate, like I knew, I knew, I knew, I knew what was gonna happen. So I was ready for it. And I also always had a sense when I was being harassed by like, you know, transphobes that I was right and they were wrong because they were, you know, they're on the wrong side of history. And a feeling of self-righteousness, that will carry you through a lot of, a lot of shit. Uh, <laughs> But what I didn't expect, and in some ways became the more difficult problem, is that I had a platform and I was transitioning. And so people saw me as a representative of trans people, which is really unfair when I was like, like this happened like two months after I came out, people were already thinking of me like this. And it's not unfair, it's unfair to me, it's unfair to the trans community, um, but it's just a situation because trans people aren't very well represented in media anywhere. So me having, you know, the platform such as it is, being a, a D-list YouTube transsexual, like it caused a level of expectation for me that was more or less impossible to me. Um, you know, trans people, it's a very diverse group of people. We don't agree on basics, like we don't agree on what gender is, we don't agree on what it even means to be trans, we don't agree on what transition is supposed to look like. So being one person supposed to represent a whole group of people, like it's not good. And it's an impossible task. And it led to a series of problems that just plagued most of 2017 for me. Um, so I would say, right, people thought I was supposed to be transsexual Gandhi, 
And at the same time, a lot of people on the left, because again, there was a lot, a lot of there was not a lot of leftist YouTube back then. They also wanted me to like be gay Lenin or like lead the revolution or whatever. And like, I was like not up to that. Um, but if people thought I was doing things the wrong way, basically, they would feel that I had betrayed them. So I made three big mistakes career-wise in 2017. Um, the first one was I, at VidCon, the YouTube conference in Anaheim, took a picture with some centrists. <laughs> and worse than that, I was smiling in the picture. So the way this works is if you are standing next to someone and someone takes a picture, and if you're smiling and that picture goes on the internet, nothing you say can convince people that you're not best friends with that person. <laughs> um, I've seen this happen to, to friends, I've seen this happen to other activists, I've seen this happen to politicians. Um, you know, you smile in a picture, you're best friends. So that's what happened. People thought that I was basically just like, you know, best friends with these counter-revolutionary bourgeois revisionists. And um, second mistake I made, they're all really the same mistake. The second mistake was I accepted an interview in New York Magazine with a journalist who is widely regarded as transphobic. Um, and the third mistake was I agreed last November to do a debate with the right-wing trans YouTuber Blair White. And by that was kind of like three strikes and I was out. And leftist Twitter was basically fully against me at that point. And that hurt much more than any amount of like 4chan or transphobia harassment. Because it's not just that I couldn't take criticism. Like I'm open to criticism. But it's that people were accusing me of essentially being a profiteering careerist who was like throwing all trans people under the bus just to advance my career by making these decisions. And it was so hurtful to me that I just couldn't function for a long time. And to this day, I don't do, I'm, I'm very reluctant to accept interviews, I'm very reluctant to agree to do events just because I'm afraid of that happening again. Um, and I've had to really change the way I act online knowing that I'm going to have to deal with that. So one of the ways I've decided to deal with it is not tweeting. Um, Twitter is bad, and you shouldn't do it. <laughs> Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, it's, it's you're, you're reluctant to say what I'm about to say because you don't want it to be taken the, by reactionaries and run with. But there are a lot of people who use Twitter and who use Twitter callouts aggressively. That is, they don't want you to change. They don't want to make the world better. They want to bring you down. And this is something that we on the leftist internet really need to figure out how to deal with. Because it's not just like if you say something problematic now, you're in trouble. Um, I think it's, it's justifiable to call someone out when they say something wrong. But when something you said in 2010 gets brought up to drag you down, what good does that do? Um, and the terror of this happening starts to consume you. I know, like, it's not just me. It's like everyone I know who does this is terrified that something from their past is going to be dug up or that they're going to misspeak slightly and then that's going to lead to a week of harassment. Like, this is not social justice activism. Like, it is harassment. And... <laughs> thank you. It's... It's hard to convince people of this because, of course, you need to be able to hold people accountable, right? You need to be able to criticize people. You need to be able to call someone out for saying something that's problematic. But it's so often done in a way where it's just not constructive. And in fact, the only reason I'm standing here is that when I started on YouTube, I was nobody. No one knew who I was. No one knew what my opinions were in 2009. If people knew my opinions in 2009, it would have been hard for me to start because my opinions weren't always super good. I mean, how many of the people in this room, like how many of you were really, really woke about trans people in 2008? <laughs> right? <laughs> like, we have to be able to make room for people to change. Um, 
and for me, that's I think about this in two ways. One is like a moral evolution, right? I guess my moral world has expanded as I've learned things, but there's also um, the gender transition, you know, and being trapped. I feel I'm trapped by this like old version of myself that's always just hanging around next to me. I can never escape it. Um, and I've dealt with that basically by um, creating more of a distinction between my public life and my private life. Because I need to make it so that I don't feel so attacked when these things happen, because it's going to happen. So as you see, see in the video, like I use a lot of a very strong persona. That's a kind of fictional character that I play on the internet. And that makes it easier for me to cope with criticism because I feel that it's not Natalie being criticized, it's ContraPoints. And that's easier to put up with. Um, the other thing that I do, and this has really become kind of what makes my YouTube channel possible at this point, um, is working with fiction. So you can, um, my colleague Lindsay Ellis last night talked about authenticity on YouTube and how it's something that's very desirable. Um, people want to see what they feel is a real person. But there's more than one way to be authentic. You don't have to be a diarist. You can also be a novelist, metaphorically speaking. So it's possible to express yourself through lying, or you can be, be yourself by becoming someone else. So this is a technique that I've used on my channel to discuss extremely controversial issues where just literally sitting in my bedroom looking at the camera and saying what my opinion is would be a bad idea. So this is my TV tropes page and I ha it has a list of like characters that I've created. So there's Abigail Cockbane who's like the anti-trans radical feminist. There's Lady Foppington, who's this like 18th century aristocrat phrenologist who shows up every time we need to talk about skulls, which is a lot. <laughs> um, there's Freya, who's a Nazi. There's Tiffany Tumbles, who's a trans woman who hates herself, which is, you know, what's that like? <laughs> um, and uh, here's a, yes, a screenshot from my upcoming video. This is my character, Tabby, who's like an anti-fascist cat girl. <laughs> and that's kind of where I'm at with this channel. I do dialogues. Um, it's a way to explore ideas without necessarily fully committing to them, which sounds cowardly, but I think that, I mean, there's a precedent, right? Like, to go back to philosophy, like Plato, that's all of Plato's philosophy is written in dialogue format between fictional characters. And it kind of works, I think, for talking about politics. And I also like the theatrical aspect of it too, because politics basically is theater, especially now. A reality TV star is the president of this country. So responding to theater with more theater actually makes sense. Um, and I think it works better than just being like some nerd in your room talking about the means of production. Like, no one wants to listen to that. Like, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> But like you need to like look at what the look at what fascism is a pageant. You have to bring your own pageant um, if you're going to work in this media world. Um, and it's also yeah, you know, it's a way of protecting yourself, a way of protecting yourself from the kind of vicious like leftist infighting, right? If you can present yourself as a more abstract figure, a more abstract author who's creating these characters, then you can ease some of the burden of being held directly accountable for every opinion that you express. So that's what's been working for me. Um, I don't presume to tell anyone else how it works, but this is the best thing that I've come up with in terms of how to survive in 2018 as a trans woman talking about fascism on the internet. <laughs> and uh, if you have a better idea, let me know. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>